Okay, so uh, welcome to um, another Crypto Village talk. Uh, I'm Matt Singleti, this is Trey, and we'll be talking about um, PKI, a public infrastructure, uh, revocation, the frailty of PKI, so specifically about uh, some weaknesses uh, in, in revocation. We're not uh, here to drop O days, but sort of to talk about the state of the industry and some things that are kind of uh, challenging for the encryption that we pretty much use every day on the web with uh, applications. Um, probably the most commonly formed, commonly used uh, kinds of encryption there are. Okay, so um, revocation began uh, as something that you did directly um, to, to distrust certificates. When you've set up PKI, you have it working, uh, you're going to find certificates that get compromised, that have problems, um, that get lost, stolen, whatever, and you have to make them distrusted. So this is what revocation is, is meant for. Um, and when that started scaling, um, it's, it's evolved over the last 20 years. Uh, the, after direct manual certificate revoking, which you do directly on your own device, or on a per specific device, non-network related manner, um, the idea of, of can, can bringing um, different kinds of uh, devices together for certificate revocation. So CRLs are a way of taking a lot of certificates and bundling up in a file that can be dispersed. Um, that evolved uh, again because it didn't scale. You're, if you have to have a, a large file with every certificate that's being revoked, that grows and grows and grows, it gets out of control. So OCSP is the next set evolution of that, and OCSP is a protocol that think of it like a database query. You're, you're saying, is this certificate good? And it'll come back and, and tell you within a time span, yes, it's good or no, it's not. So you don't retrieve all of them. You only get the stuff that you need. Um, down the road, so we'll talk about the weaknesses of these things, and then uh, down the road, what the alternatives are. Shortlist certificates are constraining the timelines to do the same, try to accomplish the same goal, and a, an effort by Google called certificate transparency. So RFC 5280 is where these things are defined. Um, in theory, there are two different states for revocation, which is revoked and held. But the reality is it's just the, the, the most common one is revoked. Um, so a little bit of background here. Uh, when certificate authorities provide certificates um, that are signed, they, they do so in kind of three general assurance levels. That's known as in the industry, the CA industry, as DV, OV, and EV. Uh, the reason this is related to revocation is that um, they have different requirements. So you have a higher level of assurance with the extended validation because the certificate authorities will go to much greater depth when, they, when they're vetting the entity that the, the, the certificate's for. Um, and one of the things that go along with that that you get is that OCSP is a requirement. So that most current kind of revocation check is made available. So this means that when you buy that $400 certificate from your CA, they're effectively obligated during that two-year timeline to provide an OCSP server and response that, that will help, that will redress that. Um, that way they're not compromising their intermediate and, and um, again, it's one of those things that's required. So this is, so when you hit uh, the green bar in your, in your um, mobile OS and you see the green lock and all that, um, that's typically involving OCSP at this point in time and CRL is still built into these devices um, but uh, less, common, less and less commonly used. It's kind of grandfathered in. The CRLs are still there, um, just not as commonly used. So there are other assurance levels. I won't go into details other than to say CAs will do their own magic, extra magic sauce for other, other levels. So for explicitly revoking trust, the, the methods vary by operating system. Um, Mac OS X uses the keychain as a GUI and then the security as the command line tool. Uh, it's one from my work that I'm the most familiar with. Um, and that those settings for, for revocation um, are found ultimately in the system trust settings P list. Um, Windows, I've got the TechNet article there um, to say also has a GUI and you can dig in, again, exercise left to the reader. Um, you, can, you can go and take specific certificates and, and mark them as untrusted. Um, for Linux, again, it's going to depend upon whether you're using LibreSSL or OpenSSL um, or whatever your stack is. Um, I've got the command here for how Mozilla handles um, uh, certificate revocation. Uh, a good example being a recently compromised certificate, uh, or at least a, a, a certificate with, from Bluecoat that was um, 
not being handled according to the agreements that Symantec and Bluecoat had. So it's one that you'd want to have pervasively across the internet, no longer trusted or used. So to take another further example, to dig a little bit further on Mac OS X, um, the security dump keychain will give you all of the, the, the system root certificates. There are about 190 or 180. Um, Apple updates these on a, on a quarterly basis or semi-annual basis. And um, th that's, again, the, the root certificates. Um, removing a root is not the same as revocation. So revocation happens um, between the intermediates and, and the lease. It's, that's how the, the revocation gets managed. But again, to manually trust or distrust for the whole, the whole chain, um, you, can, you could take a root certificate and do a security ad trusted cert deny, and then that certificate will then no longer, and all of the things that, that are chained up to it will no longer be trusted. So with this, with this command, you could, for example, remove trust to certificates from Turkey or China, uh, things like that. So it's useful. But, um, you know, there, being only 180 in, a, in, a, in the OS, if you drop the VeriSign certificate, maybe you'd lose like a third of all of your, your, you know, your connections. So you have to do this kind of carefully. I don't think Apple wants to have this being um, commonly like recommended. But if you do really need to lock down a machine, it's, it's, it's comforting to know that this is there. Um, okay. So again, that's at the level of the root. So what we'll do for the rest of this talk is step through certificate revocation list, CRLs, the old way of doing it, and then OCSP, the, pr the protocol that's more common and standard currently. So CRLs are encoded as a DUR or PEM file, and effectively it's just a file that's being hosted. Um, Within the X509 header of a certificate, there'll be an EKU, an extended key usage that basically designates where the CRL will be for that certificate. So when you're doing the chain evaluation, it knows where to check. Um, so you would have a domain, a domain set up and a domain name associated with that, that um, when the certificate is, in, is used in a circumstance in which revocation has to be checked, um, which can also be a requirement in the X509 header, it will go out and make that connection and, and do that check. So um, OpenSSL CRL, uh, there's a command, um, uh, I don't see it on this slide, but anyway, there's a command in OpenSSL to, to create the file that could be hosted that way. Um, and then I just want to note in passing, in addition to the X509 headers, the certificate policy statements from the CA will also have these um, and describe how they're operating and how they're handling revocation. So here's how to make Apache serve CRLs. There's a Apache config directory SSL CA revocation path or SSL CA revocation file. And you point that to the file where you're hosting these. And then when the request gets made over, typically over HTTP uh, or HTTPS, then that file gets received and the stack that's evaluating the chain will see all those things to revoke and prevent them from being evaluated as, as trusted. So basically, you, um, again, a CRL is just this bag of certificates that are untrusted that grows over time. Um, also, OpenVPN has a directive that can, that's, that's related. So next slide. Um, we were, other places you can find these things, here are a couple little Google strings that can help you just find scads and scads of, um, of certificate revocation lists that are hosted out there. Um, the, the certificate authorities largely host these, uh, and large organizations that are doing PKI uh, will also, you know, keep these collections of, of untrusted certificates. And once it's untrusted, you kind of can't, it kind of sticks around forever. Um, these things, the, 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 the contents of those, you never want to say, well, we've been untrusting all this time, but we'll take it out. I mean, you have to kind of keep maintaining these lists and they grow, which is why OCSP is, is, is a more attractive option. Um, I also want to point out that the, the policies for checking CRLs and, and, and handling revocation sometimes are at the operating system level and sometimes they're at the, the, the application level. So it, it takes a little bit of kind of thought to figure out when you're using an app, you know, is it your OS making the check or is it the app making a check? And a, a good sort of uh, example here is Firefox handles it all within its own app. So it'll, it'll have the entire stack uh, in, in Mozilla Firefox by itself. Uh, Mozilla has a nice uh, feature um, that pushes CRLs in a compressed form out uh, in, in every, on a, on a three-week basis. So Firefox is doing some really cool stuff. Um, there's a, a, a file, a format for compressed CRLs um, there I've, I've shown. 
and then uh, the patch where Mozilla has done that. Um, next slide. The reason that um, Mozilla and Firefox are doing this is that they're kind of keeping up with Google's Certificate Transparency Initiative, where oh, you have large sets of certificates that are, 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 are not trusted, and, and yet not necessarily the ability to scale um, with a lot of requests, because as you make a request, it's more overhead every time you do an SSL request. So um, it's kind of hard to find, but if you dig for it or if you, if you watch your traffic for a three or four week period on Firefox, you'll see it make a request out to this blocklist.addons.mozilla.org to pull down that set. Um, and then again, some links to Mozilla uh, policies about um, where the CAs can report revoke certificates. But by and large, it's not really in the, in the certificate authority's interest to do a lot of this reporting to the public. Um, it's more headache. It's things that don't work instead of things that do. So that they're not terribly incentivized economically to keep the CAs or to, to keep their, their contents of their revoked uh, set made public. Um, so it would be good for us to keep the CAs on track and, and make sure that they're actually doing their job and, and handling revocation correctly. Um, Okay, so on to OCSP. Um, again, the online certificate status protocol. Uh, it's encoded in ASN1 with all the joys and tribulations that brings with it. So ASN1 is abstract syntax notation. It's very compressed um, encoding format. Um, and uh, it's as a protocol, you basically um, are making an outbound request for a given certificate or a given chain to see if it's, if it's valid or not. Um, again, run with very high availability requirements uh, on and very low ping times for these for the for the big CAs. Um, on the client side, the the requests are, are good for a, a given a given span of time, and there's the span of time in which this this the the CA can provide the response for, which might be you know you're good for the next year or something, and then there's the actual caching of that check by the OS or the application. So there's a lot of different sort of time slices um, to keep in mind when you're troubleshooting and working through this. Like I said, there's the official, here's what the, the, the server, OCSP server will tell you, and then there's what the actual clients are doing with it. Those are very often very different timelines. So you, you'd want your browser to, or your, your device to, to check on a fairly periodic basis, even though you know, maybe the certificate's good for a year or two years, which is typical for EV, the next day maybe that was revoked, so how do you know it's still good, right? So there's this kind of set of different, different timelines about whether the, when, when, under what period of time the certificate is good. Um, all right, next, next slide. Okay. Um, and right now we're just going to walk you through working uh, through a basic example of going through an OCSP query. Um, and these are actually pretty straightforward. Uh, this is an open SSL command, the command's at the top, the first bit of the output. These are kind of long outputs. Uh, but basically what it's going to do is start going to get the certificate. Uh, the next thing you would want to do is save it as a file, which is that last little redirect I've got at the end. Um, and then literally it's this one open SSL x509 command, and this is all you've got to do to parse it, and you'll get this URL. And this is basically telling you the OCSP URL, uh, URI. Um, and that's basically all you have to do to verify, um, you know, where it is. Um, for the next example, we're looking at how you actually do the query if you've got a chain. Um, and this first step is the same. We're just going to save the certificate to a file so that we've got it. Um, but then this part we're, we're going to do is grab the certificate chain. And this is going to vary in length depending on, you know, how the certificate's signed, number of intermediaries, also sometimes where you're at if you've got an intermediary or whatever listening on your network or through your, you know, country or whatnot. Um, but this is going to pull all that data. And you can start seeing inside of it um, all the different uh, issuers of, you know, who, who all's in the certificate chain for that. Uh, the next thing is this is just a simple command. We're going to save the chain to a file. Um, and then this is inside of that chain file. And if you look at this right here, you see the I. The I is the issuer. Um, that's the first thing that you're actually going to look for because you're going to actually want to be verifying who's issuing the certificate for this particular website. So this is the thing that you're going to have to pull out of that. Um, and then this is where you're actually going to verify the certificate with the issuer. And you can see what we did is we pulled the chain 
as the issuer. Um, we did this for DEF CON, and then we actually are going straight to the certificate provider for the DEF CON, uh, OCSP URL, and that's going to be a site. They're usually something like this, OCSP.SSLProvidersName.com. Um, the important thing is not to be fooled by this successful response, but make sure that the cert status is actually good. Um, so this can be a little misleading. You want to make sure that you're actually getting the cert directly uh, certified uh, from the issuer. Um, okay. So, um, and we'll maybe we'll just stop for a second. Any questions so far? Yes. So that, that those those responses are signed, so they're they're, they're signed by the the issuing CA. Oh, no. There's an the, issue that we're going to talk about in a couple of slides that does have to do with one part of your question. Okay. Yeah. So, we were, we were talking about the uh, CSP staple and CSP, or CSP bus staple messages as well as the difference between the HTTP public key and the. We're uh, on the way. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Can you repeat the question? So let me repeat the question to make sure I get it. So you're saying with this, uh, the timeline for the next update, um, is there a reason for the, the client to, it is there a requirement for the client to go and make another request after that expires? So the question is, are the OCSP queries cached? Yes, the answer is yes. And the policy for that uh, can depend upon the, the requesting stack. So most, most um, browsers and operating systems will have a cache for the OCSP queries for that reason. And they'll all have timelines for when that's done. So when it does the evaluation, there's a time check every time. Hopefully that's helpful. Okay, next, next question. Okay, so um, uh, just some words about revocation um, on iOS. Um, this, th th these aren't typically things that you can access unless you've got a jailbroken device. The CRL is located um, in VARDB. Um, the OCSP daemon is there. Uh, these were used in previous jailbreaks uh, and, and so they've, they've been attacked. It's part of the infrastructure that gets attacked. Um, the revocation cache is in a SQLite file. And again, you can't do this on your iPhone unless you jailbreak it and, and uh, directly uh, work, work with uh, these files. But it, when you get that SQLite file, you can actually take a look at the contents of a SQLite uh, in, in SQL and, and query it out and see the contents of that. Um, if you want to reset that or you know, basically I think the, the only thing I can find that's sort of like officially sanctioned by Apple for interacting with revocation um, is other than other than when you receive the certificate and it's not signed, you have the option to either trust it or not trust it at the very beginning. But is is to use the resetting reset network settings, which will blow away the cache. That's kind of awkward though, because then it gets rid of a bunch of other settings at the same time. So there's not a whole lot of granularity for this um, in, in on iOS. But uh, again, um, the the goal is to make these slides a resource for a general resource for people investigating a revocation. So. Um, maybe some helpful things if you want to look further and, and, and some pointers as to where to look. So in some ways OCSP is a privacy disaster. Um, and I think this is, if, if there's one takeaway from this talk, I, I, I would like it to be this, which is that as you're surfing and you hit a site where you need to, you haven't visited before, um, let's say you go through um, uh, an online commerce store and you visit some products and then you go to the checkout site, which is HTTPS, that will initiate the OCSP request when that's not cached. And so you effectively leave a trail of requests out to the OCSP infrastructure of where you've been. 
And uh, it's not very commonly talked about that your browser history for HTTPS sites is being leaked or given to the OCSP server operators. The, um, the, it's called a responder. But, um, so you have to have a very high level of trust with your CA, who, the, the people who are running that server, because effectively you're giving them that snapshot of your browser history that includes um, every site that you visited that has an HTTPS connection on it. Um, it would be good if someone kind of queried the big CAs to make even more clear whether they're using that data for any purposes. It would be uh, very valuable for data mining. Um, and it's not that there's a right or wrong answer to whether that should be done so much as the policy should be very, very clear to the general public um, what, what, the, what the use of that data ever could be. Um, I've got a slide a little bit later that will show the different levels of logging on an OCSP server, and they can pretty much get, I mean, they're going to get your time and date stamp, they're going to get your IP address, and they're going to get uh, the domain that you're requesting. Some user agent browser data will go across because it's, uh, a lot of times it's going to be an HTTP type of connection, so you're going to have some uh, information about the browser which might identify or de-anonymize who you are, especially in conjunction with the time and the IP address. Yeah. Uh, all of those can decrypt our trash, right? That's correct. So we are already trusting them. No other than That's true. What about the main what about bot domains? What about Google Analytics? Is that getting that? In the OCSP query, in other words, you know, it's obviously making an HTTPS connection, right? HTTP, all of the normal HTTPS standards are fine. Right? What about the non-domain cookies? So let me repeat the question. The question is what about the non-domain cookies? So to be clear, this isn't your web traffic that's being exposed. It's only a check for verification of a certificate that belongs to the domain of the of the secure one. So you're not getting inside traffic. All all your all your um, the other thing is leaking is is the domain name. Yeah, because it's cached, it's also not as powerful as a cookie where you're going to see like every URL they dig into or anything like that. You're just seeing the initial connection the first time that browser goes to a site that has HTTPS. So. It's, it's um, not as much information as Google cookies or Google AdWords. Yeah. Does it only check the certificate or does it also check the page that you're on? So you only get um, a check for that domain. So it doesn't, it's not traversing. Below that. That's correct. It's, it's on a per domain basis. But let's say, you know, if let's an example um, path might be like you go to Amazon and then you check out. And so you visit a couple uh, web pages for, for products. None of that would be leaked. What you what you leak is when it's not cached, the fact that you hit the HTTPS, you know, store.amazon.com or whatever site, and the, and the time and date when that happened. But again, you're effectively it's pretty likely if if someone wanted to go after that data, they'd be able to get a lot of specifics around what kind of device you have. The, um, there's a bigger issue is if you have a large scale aggregation of data. Let's say you're in a repressive country or something and a whistleblower goes to a site and uploads some information and stuff, it might identify that whistleblower. So it's, it's situations like that where it can become a much more dangerous scenario rather than the day-to-day -day user might have. Yeah. So. What, happens if, uh, what happens if the OCSP query fails? So what happens if the OCSP query fails? Um, or, or, or OCSP comes back and says, I don't know anything about this. Yes. So, so not an, an, the response where it doesn't know anything about it is actually then a pass because it's saying it's not revoked. Um, so, so when CA A, so consider CA A issued a certificate, CA B issued a forged certificate for the same domain to go to compromise. So, mul mul with with. So before I jump into the answering the question about um, man in the middle with multiple CAs, I want to point out that there are different levels of failure mode here. Sometimes the fail is hard, sometimes it's soft. So what does that mean? 
um, the, the does does do you continue on with that session enabling that encryption to occur or do you hard cut it off and that's really up to the browser and the, the, the policies in your OS um, and the different operating systems handle that differently it'd be cool if we had a nice table showing you know how each how they all they all handle them but they're a little bit different so hard fail and soft fail is, is a difference um, and if you don't mind we'll keep going on the, on the presentation and get back to the man in the middle thing later, a little bit later so um, you noticed when we did the OCSP request, it had that, uh, the date range at the bottom. Um, they are time sensitive. And uh, basically, you're, again, the cache is held by the device. And um, it, it, it should, can only be good for that. But you, know, you could have a certificate that, that gets compromised out, you know, within under that time window. Um, so it's good to think of this always in terms of you know a timeline. So again, your EV certificate's good for two years, but if you're looking at how this revocation infrastructure works, it has to be able to provide effectively an ongoing 24/7 availability of is this certificate you know known to be compromised or not. Um, so it, it helps to think of it um, in terms of the failure modes of the system as always having a time element to it. Okay, next slide. So um, revocation is not just for SSL. Um, SSH certificates, uh, or, uh, quick show of hands, who's a, a SSH user? Familiar with authentic key, keys? Okay, awesome. You're in the right place if you're, if you're a crypto village, okay. Um, OpenSSH 6.8 has a feature called key revocation lists. What this lets you do is have a set of keys, SSH keys that are revoked. So the normal model for SSH authentication is you have a key pair that you exchange that you are allowing in. Um, you can you can you can um, graft on PKI to that authentication, and this this is a mechanism for taking certificates that are bad. So if you had a red team come and own own your a couple boxes on your on your enterprise network, and they left some keys around, it'd probably be good to drop these in a revoke keys list so that they couldn't be used anywhere else. And in general, I think having the mindset of managing SSH keys by a revoke keys list puts you in a much better position to respond to you know, attacks and, and challenges with compromised keys. So again, just some directives here in your H SSHD config to turn it on. Um, it's called a KRL, which is a key revocation list. Um, and you you'd basically provide that as a file, um, which basically it stores all the bad uh, keys as hashes. And then every time you're author authorized in, it'll, it'll check that against it. So just good to know. I don't see this in heavy usage out there, probably because the PKI authentication integration for SSH is not all that common. But um, hopefully it'll be more common in the future. So you want to take that? Oh, okay. Uh, and this is like we were just uh, kind of pointing out that if you've got uh, traffic that you can capture either on your network or from your browser and your host and stuff, you, you, Wireshark has a built-in OCSP decoder. And so you can actually run Wireshark or T-Shark, capture that data, and start looking at what's going on on your network. Um, this is useful for a number of reasons. You'll also see things like might be software or operating system updates on your network. You might catch a lot of different things. When the uh, OCSP queries are being made via HTTP rather than the HTTPS connections. So you get a little bit more information if you're a network admin of stuff that might be going through your network. Um, but that's already built into Wireshark and we just kind of wanted to point that out real quick. Yep, there's, there's been built-in support for OCSP uh, since Wireshark 1.0, which is kind of cool. It's a protocol that's been around a long time. All right. Um, if you want to run your own OCSP responder, you can do that with OpenSSL. And, um, you know, p pick a port. I believe there's not a standard port for that. Uh, 2560 comes to mind. I don't know. Um, but uh, in this example, 7654. So you basically give this OpenSSL command and use an indexed file that um, when you set up the CA, you, it basically keeps a, a list of, of certificates that are being under management in that file and then you mark them as revoked. Um, so there, there's a little bit of a question about how well just OpenSSL by itself scales for traffic. So typically um, the big CAs, in fact every CA that I know of is, isn't using OpenSSL. Um, they're actually using another thing called uh, EJBCA. So EJBC is Enterprise Java Beans Certificate Authority. It's like a suite for managing a CA um, out of Prime Key, and they're, um, they were I typically you know at RSA and Black Hat. Uh, anybody from Prime Key in the house? Okay, 
Um, they're, they're, they're a really great solution. Uh, it's, it's Java and Oracle backed, so it'll scale like crazy. Um, it typically has a lot of load balancing, net scalar type infrastructure in front of it when you want to really like, you know, do the things at the size of Symantec or, or Digis or the big CAs. Um, it's got three logging modes. So you can log. So what I'm describing here are, is the logging behind the scenes that as you're hitting these OCSP servers, it can go on. Um, there's just log4j for um, doing kind of daemon level logging for just troubleshooting the daemon and, and that it's got network connectivity and whatnot. Then there's transaction level logging, which can be customized. And then finally, what they call audit logs. So if you turn on audit logs, um, if those audit logs are turned on, that's where you just get a complete stream, you know, of everyone's uh, request for this stuff. And that's kind of the privacy scare story right there. Um, so again, this, these are features that are built in already. And um, if, if that data gets streamed off and, and, caught and, you know, captured for data analytics purposes, again, it's neither good nor bad. It's just I think that the public could, could use some insights into, um, you know, if the CAs are doing that and, and uh, what, they're, what they're doing with that data. So also to say that, you know, it, it's a really, really dominant solution. Every, every um, OCSP responder I can find uh, is, is, is uh, backed by, by PrimeKey's EJBC. It's really, really dominant in the marketplace. And when you see that kind of monoculture, like if there was a flaw in that and someone could, you know, take down those servers, it could be, it could be get pretty crazy. It's a little bit of a risk aggregation for, for global PKI usage. So short-lived certificates in terms of alternatives to um, OCSP and CRLs, like maybe this could be kind of like where we're going with the future. Um, Short-lived certificates are one of those options. Um, it kind of came into, into vogue around uh, 2012. There's a Dan Bonet paper about short-lived certificates in which they very clearly declare that OCSP is as good as dead. And I guarantee you it's the, probably the number one revocation check going on right now. Um, doesn't look like it'll change anytime soon, but it's good to have alternatives. Um, the recommended timelines are like a weeks or days, things of that timeline. And the, basically it would mean that the CAs would be just issuing, you know, very, very short list certificates. So there, it, it would, it's going to be pretty, pretty heavy lifting. If you think about, let's say your Apache servers would be replacing their, their, their certificate every, every week. I mean, it could, it could be kind of, uh, challenging to get that set up, and, and it will also make the usage of, of PKI a little bit more dependent upon the CA. So they're kind of in favor, I think, in some ways. But it, it's, it's a pretty complex topic. There's a lot of um, challenging effort that would have to go in to make this actually work. Um, but that's one option. Again, with OCSP, you get this validity timeline, but the certificates are all the same. You only replace it when it fails. This would just be a continually replaced certificate, like on a weekly basis. Um, the ACME project at, at uh, Mozilla Firefox would, would fit very well with that vision to be able to um, uh, very quickly validate that a certificate is good from the CA for a specific domain. So what's the minimum time for this? That's actually still under, under um, discussion. The, the industry at large, the CAs, the browser and OS companies are all debating that right now. There's a, there's a variety of issues with the IoT. So there are IoT providers that have ways to manage certificates or having unique certificates on or client certificates on each one of their devices. But there are hardware manufacturers that might just do stuff in bulk that can create huge problems with these kind of things. Um, so yeah, there's a huge issue with that. There's also a huge issue for apps, not necessarily because of the app stores. The app stores are frequently doing the right thing, but if somebody writes bad code on the back end on how it's checking in, there's, there's multiple layers where that can occur in software. So it, it, there are other issues there too, for sure. So another alternative for revocation infrastructure is called certificate transparency. And it's not really a, certificate, a CT talk, for those familiar with it, but I'll just give a quick highlight. Um, CT is a, a Google-driven effort. And it basically applies a blockchain to this problem. And uh, it's, it's being um, already implemented in Google's operating systems and browsers. So it's kind of in place and going. As, as far as I understand, anyone from Google here, um, Chrome is not um, making OCSP requests as a habit. Um, it's using CT in, in, instead of that. Um, 
a good place to kind of CT, see some of the CT logs. The census.io from uh, Michigan has uh, a nice sort of description of like, statuses on all these CT logs that are in operation. So think of these as uh, blockchain um, servers that are, are provide, able to provide statuses on certificates. Um, and then, you know, with the future of certificate transparency, there's a, there's a debate ongoing about how redaction is handled, which would basically be the ability to make exceptions for presence in the blockchain. So kind of a current topic that would, uh, you know, open up lots of um, challenges to, to the, the future of CT. So I'll just leave it at that. And uh, the certificate transparency.org site, which Google operates, is a great source of information. Right, right. So does, would CT, um, that, that would be a policy. So the question is, did, would CT handle every certificate that gets issued? Um, that would be a policy level uh, a question. So the certificate authorities um, would, would answer that question for you, and they would either say, yes, we're going to operate this route with that assumption that every certificate comes out of here would be in, in, the, in the blockchain, or um, they may not do that. And, uh, you know, right now we're in a situation where the, the most of the routes out there don't have CT support by default. So there will be a transition period where if that is the goal, that we'll have to get, take some halfway steps to get to that point. So how is CT better than OCSP? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't require um, an, an outbound request. The, the revocation typically gets bundled and then, and then sent out on a periodic basis. Again, the timeline question applies. Um, it's better in the sense that there is an automated, it, it, there are a number of reasons. Um, it it's subjects the issuances to um, you know, a, an, automated, an automatic process that would provide you some level of assurance that it has been issued and the details of that issuance, which right now um, there are you know, human factors that could get in the way or, or things that are not logged. So it's, it's, um, it just provides, it's, again, it provides automation, among other things. Uh, but again, this is not really a CT talk. Maybe there'll probably be a future talk uh, here at DEF CON on CT, I'm sure. Um, so in summary, um, you, know, you have to take your, your need to revoke trust about as important as your ability to establish trust. So it's, it's, it's revoking a certificate creates kind of a failure of PKI, right? This is where the website doesn't work. You know, it's, it's, it, you can't reach the site, you can't get authenticated, stuff does not work. Um, but if you don't have a, a fluid mechanism for handling revocation, um, you, you're not in a good position, right? You should be able to revoke as easily as you can grant on some level. Um, and then um, we kind of walk through um, examples for CRL and then another example for OCSP. And for those who join late, the, this slide deck provides a nice kind of worked example that you can use to kind of s run this on your own operating system. And then um, online real-time revocation checks uh, are kind of a privacy disaster and require you to, to place a, a level of trust in your certificate authority that exists there, of course, because they're your CA, but in addition, you know, as you use, you know, you don't think of, like, all, so list all of the certificate authorities out there as you browse. You don't sit there and say, oh, I just went to, um, you know, order a pair of shoes online. Now I have, now I just told that to Digicert. Or um, I'm going to go, um, what's another good example? Or, or, you know, hit a messaging server, and now Semantic knows that I did that, right? But those are the things that are actually happening with these outbound requests for, for the use of revocation. What's that? Yes, yeah. or whatever, whatever your um, vice of choice is. <laughs> so, um, Some, yeah. Something else that uh, we notice uh, that kind of comes up, it's not necessarily an OCSP or CRL thing, but the, the, um, there's an issue where people are not checking the certificates in line when they're surfing. And so if you're in a repressed country or repressed corporation and maybe they've got blue code or something like that. We talked about the blue code one that, you know, might be revoked, but 
checking the chain of certificates is going to tell you if there are people that are decoding traffic. If you've got a certificate added to your box where people can sit there, your be it the corporation you work for, whatever, or government or whatnot, it, it's going to show you who else can decode some of your traffic. So it's it's a really important check, um, and it's something that most people don't think about. So it's something worth you know looking into. Again, it's not directly related. We ran across a lot of different certificate issues and certificate issues with like IoT and stuff like that. They're not revocation issues per se, but they're definitely interesting things to, you know. Uh, a little bit different. So how do you check the OCSP response si signature? So um, that, that will be in the log for the example, but um, that's handled by uh, Libre SSL, Open SSL, your your stack will will make that check and fail out with that that signature is not not correct. How do you revoke? So revo revocation would be um, the presence of that um, in in your OCSP server, right? So when when that responder has that in its database, then that would be providing that as a a, a revoked certificate. So again, the, 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 the pro, you, if you look at the protocol, you can see it's uh, HTTP plain text. You can read it and see that, that, that that's taken place. Does that answer your question? trying to verify that the OCSP server's certificate is valid. Um, we could, you could actually make the request that we showed earlier to check against the certificate server and the, the way that OCSP communication is authenticating is whether you're going to know whether it's the same one. You'd have to manually do that. I mean, there's nothing in the software that checks that on a regular basis. Yeah, if the CA is compromised, you could... It's only, it only applies to the one who issued the cert. Okay. It, it, it Next has slide. To, oh, okay. That's, that's correct. But the, the requests are signed. Okay, so shouts out to the DEF CON goons, um, DC206, DC408, DC404. Um, the CA browser forum has a revocation working group that are working on um, some of these topics and they're hard at work at trying to kind of improve the situation. So shouts out to those guys. The Apple ProdSec team, hey. Um, team Opsters and uh, hi mom. I think we're, I think we're good. Any, uh, so other questions? And uh, we are out of time, yes. Yeah, so the question of stap OCSP stapling. Um, there's specifically a flag with, with OCSP must staple, which is not in common use, which basically allows the server that you're talking to to make that request out to the OCSP server and give it back to you signed, rather than the browser or operating system making that server directly. So that's exactly right. I should have had a slide there for that. Um, so OCSP must staple is, is a promising way forward that, that does resolve some of those privacy concerns. Yeah, the only thing is we don't see we don't see that many people using it. Um, yeah. It's just when they're setting up their certs, they get this working, they're happy, it's working, they leave. You know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what about the OCSP must staple as a support browser? Is this something that today is really important for the audience? So the question is, which browsers are supporting OCSP must staple? I don't know. Off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. There are common browsers that do support it. Uh, Chrome, I'm pretty sure Safari does. CA pending, and I think, yeah, you're correct that that, that, that does prevent a lot of this stuff. The, the issue that we end up running into is that, like, you know, if you're in a repressed country or something like that, you may not have ever connected to the site in the whistleblower case to be able to have the pending set up to be able to really help. So it's kind of a.
I mean, what, what is the, and where, and where does the line, like, so I, I convince myself that must take the plus feeling equals better than just. Yeah, the, and I agree with that. I, th I think that more controls are better because you don't necessarily know how the browser or software, it's not necessarily a browser, is going to implement the checks. And so the more checks, the better are going to be the case in that. So, yeah. Okay, thank you.